All right, ready? Three, two, one. Chris Sharp, how are we doing? I'm good, mate. It's good to see you. It's been a it's been a minute. It has been. It has been. I know it's uh it's funny. People who know you mainly from my channel from the first ever mic'd up series that I did kind of went a little viral and everybody got to know you a little bit uh, on the coaching side. And we did we have a little sit down, but it was kind of a weird rushed uh, situation. So I just excited to kind of have you back here in more of a not so calm, but calm enough setting. It's brilliant. I, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at your background here and it's changed so much since we did this in, in this <laughs> dimension last time, which is fantastic. So I'm excited, mate. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I just want to catch everybody up and a question I'd like to start usually the episodes with is just how are you really doing? I know everyone asks you how you're doing and every now and again, you can kind of give them a, a very short abbreviated answer. So I'm just curious to know how's life? How are you really doing? I'm doing great. I think, you know, we talked a little bit yesterday. I, I'm, I'm enjoying life right now. It's, you know, I've got a boy who's about to turn two um, who absolutely is in love with soccer. And it is amazing to me. You know, I speak to so many people about this, but just to enjoy a Saturday morning before our games on the couch, watching a Premier League game, and he sits there as a one and a half, two year old, mesmerized by the game. And that to me is just, it just typifies how good things are. Um, comes to the games, loves watching. Uh, he loves Will, Uncle Will. That's his, it's, you know, how, Dada, where's Will? Where's Will? Um, I think he sees so much of Will on, in my video and on my TV screen at home. So it's, you know, Will is part of the family now. But yeah, I, mate, life is great. The, 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 the lads are, are coming around nicely. I think after the Open Cup last night, we're nine games unbeaten. We'd love a couple more wins in there, but the lads are doing really well right now. They're just starting to, to, to hit their stride. So hopefully we can keep that going. But yeah, mate, I'm good. I'm busy. The R2s are doing well. You know, young Adam has been in the national team camp again. You know, I myself was in the national team camp, I guess, for the Mexico game. So that was a really nice experience. Family's healthy, happy. So, mate, really, if you want to know, really, really, I'm actually really good. Um, busy, which is fantastic, and 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 doing everything that I love. So, and, and Will is playing excellently this year. So I can't complain. It's it's always so nice to to hear that things are going really, really well. And and I know for you, having your your son now two years. What do you think, you know, fatherhood has, has taught you and maybe were things that you weren't expecting and now you're, you're a changed man in a sense? Yeah, I think, mate, what everyone's always told me is that there is more to life than just football. Football is, is my life. It's been my life. It's everything to me. But what he has showed me is there is things away from the football field that are more important. And it's given me a nice balance, I think, to be able to share that with him it excites me because he's only in his very infancy, but hopefully as he gets older and he really enjoys it, I can share the same passion with him. But I think, yeah, just that there's, there is other things, you know, and, and look, I'm 41 now and for 40 years, I've, it's been football for me, you know? So it, it's just, it's been a nice realization that, you know, that there is moments when I can take a break. There is moments when I can sit down and watch the game on TV and not have to worry about anything else for a couple of hours there is times on Sunday where him and I can go across the park and kick a soccer ball around, you know? And I think for me, that's given me a really nice feel the last 12 months. Cause obviously now he's old enough to run and walk and things like that. And I'll be honest with you, mate, there's nothing better now, nothing better than the lads keeping a clean sheet, getting a win and then him coming on the field and in the dressing room after and sharing that with myself. That to me is just the best. So I know I've, I've seen, I've seen some posts on your Instagram. I mean, maybe it's your dad's birthday or things yeah. like that. And, and uh, obviously it seems like you guys are very close. So is there something that maybe growing up uh, your father taught you that, you know, now you're kind of trying to pass down to your son? Yeah. You know, it's, it's funny. I was talking about my wife the other day about this. My dad was, was old school. He was very, I, I just say, I don't, want, I don't want to use the word strict, but it was very much, he wanted me to succeed. Uh, there was no room for failure you know, which has kind of put me in the position that I am, I, I think that I'm in, in the way that I think, you know, but I think for me, my dad was a very loving man. Uh, he was very supportive of me, not in a way that like you don't worry, there's always next time, not that kind of way, but you are good at what you do. You can be better at what you do. There is ways to be better at what you do. Just kind of giving me that focus. And I think for me, you know, my, my boy's only two and, you know, but he just loves he loves to listen. He loves kicking the soccer ball. I mean, he loves golf too. We got him some golf clubs, but he will sit there and listen to how to set up, use two hands, keep his head down, swing, hit the golf ball cleanly at two years old or not even two years old yet. You know, I, I think there's little things there that 
hopefully I can help him with as he gets older. And I think that's kind of maybe the little bits and pieces that my dad has passed along to me is to really, you know, when I'm with him, just spend the quality time with him and try and help him do the little things he loves doing and enjoy doing. And that, that to me has been quite enjoyable. I love that. Yeah. I think the interesting part too, is like you're saying, your dad's always kind of pushing you to strive for more. And I know before you had your son and maybe when we first connected, I always felt like there was so much on your plate and you were able to somehow manage everything and mm -hmm. to see that you've been able to kind of just be more present. I'm sure you were present before, but now you're saying things are, there's more to football than just football. Yeah. And I think that's the, that's the beautiful thing about having kids. Not that I have any yet, but from every, every time I have a conversation yeah. with somebody that seems yeah. to be uh, the, the thing that they always mention. But um, for you, I know that we're talking about that. I think when you have a book of your life and you kind of look back when you're 90 years old, hopefully, mm -hmm. and you start thinking about this current stage, this current chapter, uh, what would you, if you can, give me a title for it? Oh, that's a good question. It'd be like chapter 92 at this point, I think. <laughs> Everything that we've gone through. Um, the title for it, it, it would be somewhere in the, in the way of like, you don't know how it feels until it happens. Love that. People always say, that the kids will change your life and you're like yeah maybe maybe not you know what i mean they change your life they change your outlook on things they change your perspective on things they change the reason why you do things um so something in that moment of you know you, you don't really know until it happens it's really opened up my eyes to what life is all about really um mm -hmm. and all the hard work that you put in on a daily basis as a coach as a player as a as a husband uh, whatever else it is as, as a son. I mean, even just the point where the grandparents, they're, they're so involved and, and they, they light up with your kids. That makes me happy because it's, I get to see my mum and, and, and my wife's parents enjoy and my dad enjoy the kids so much as well, you know? So I think that that's got to be, yeah, somewhere in that realm of, I, I don't really, you don't really know until you, it actually happens to you. I think it's probably a, a decent title for me and then you can go many different directions from there, you know? No, I love that. Sometimes when you ask people how they're doing, they'll say, yeah, I'm doing great. I'm doing great. But you always look deeper and deeper and say, okay, yeah. really what's going on? But it seems like, again, uh, from the start, you've been very, very uh, just positive. And it seems like, does that now translate into the coaching side of things where, you know, hey, if you're having a rough day and you guys are nine unbeaten, so maybe I caught you at the right time. But before, yeah. I'm sure wins and losses, uh, performances from the goalkeeper maybe kind of put you in a roller coaster of emotions. So every now and again, you just kind of look at your son, look at your wife, look at your family and say, OK, you know what? It's cool. I can kind of yeah. choose to be. Yeah. Yeah, I think too, mate. Look, you know, we, we all go through the ups and downs and, and everything's better when you're winning football games. That That's a fact. You know, everything's better. Not that we're winning every game, but we're 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 in the in the mix. You know, even when you have the, the rough days or the bad results, nothing beats coming home and seeing the little man. You know, just it, 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 it doesn't matter to him. You know, it's kind of, it kind of, you know, you get sixty minutes of not really worrying about it for that moment, but all of a sudden, then reality hits you again. Like oh, crap, I got to get back to to again. So, but yeah, mate, look, I think you you, you say you go through ebbs and flows in a season where things are great. You know, things yeah. aren't going so well. You got to find, you got to dig deep. But I think I've been in it long enough now to, to manage the ebbs and the flows emotionally. And obviously adding things to that when you get home, it, it helps a bunch. But, you know, at the end of the day, you know, as my wife says that, you know, she's always happy either Will keeps a clean sheet, Marco keeps a clean sheet. <laughs> we win the football game or we score a set piece. She she knows that the Sunday is going to be a good day, you know, so it's a... <laughs> <laughs> I want to switch gears a little bit and then... I think the way the new this new show is set up, I want to give some advice to players and then advice to coaches. So I know you're on the goalkeeping side, so maybe most of the things you're saying are towards goalkeeping, but you're around the first team. You've been around the first team set up for, I don't know, almost over a decade now. Yep. So you can answer this question in two ways. What are some of like the tangible qualities that you from the goalkeeping side, but also you and Robin and guys that you've worked with kind of look yep. for uh, from players? Yeah, it's, it's a great question because I think, you can delve into this at a grassroots level and it kind of resonates as the kids get older. Look, for me as a goalkeeper coach, and we, you and I have had many discussions about this, I think when you have developed your methodology and you've developed your way of seeing the game and the way you want to coach the kids, we look at it and go, okay, we can make them technically better. We can afford to make them tactically better. You know, I, I think there is tangible things there now in goalkeeping, size, athleticism, that, you look for when you're recruiting a young goalkeeper or what the potential are in there. 
the two tangible ones that you can maybe kind of catch early are the ability to lead, the, the ability to be comfortable in leadership roles, in, in managing young men or women, in managing team environments, in, you know, we put a big emphasis at our club on, you know, the away trips and making sure the kids are doing the right things. But I think in the same line, the second part of that is the personality piece. I think the ability to be comfortable in uncomfortable situations, the ability, again, to lead the line from the back, to dominate a game with your voice. Games are going to go through ebbs and flows. You know, you're going to be under the pump. Can you manage tempo? Do you have the ability in your personality to manage tempo? You have the ability to put your team on the back a little bit and make decisions that may be against what the team is trying to achieve. For example, the coach would like you to play out. You have a system of playing out from the back, whatever it looks like, you know, in a two, in a three, doesn't matter, in a four, in a five. You know, the young goalkeeper turns around and goes, you know what, we've just been on the pump for the last three minutes. I'm going to go long. I'm going to squeeze my lines. I'm going to find a target. I think all that can sometimes go missed because those are tangible things that that young man or young woman is going to have as they get older and go into the first team. And mm. I think that we can, into college, into, into ECNL, into MLS's next, whatever it looks like, I think we can, as good goalkeeper coaches, give those kids more stuff. We, we give them a little bit more physical ineptitude in the gym and, and with the, the sports science we have now we can give them more tactical information with the video and the way we're trying to play we can help them with their technical abilities and their shot stopping and their cross taking stuff like that but i can't give you personality and i can't give you leadership abilities you know you can try and mold it and we can help edge them that way but i think the tangible piece of it you know i, I give a great example our 17s and 15s played salt lake this weekend and we came back on saturday night or at least I jumped out there to watch the MLS's next game on Sunday morning. And there was a boy in there, Salt Lake team, who I've liked for a while. He's out of Utah, but he's got an aura about him that is just, it's a really nice aura. He plays really, really high. He's really comfortable playing high. He's really comfortable with the ball, his feet. He's really comfortable with those forwards running at him. He's really comfortable backpedaling at high speeds to try and find a decent position. He's a loud boy. He's organizing. He comes for crosses well. He starts high when players are probably in positions where he can be a little bit deeper. I'd rather have that and rein it back than be trying to give it to you. And I think that's a massive tangible piece of a puzzle right now with the way the game's going and teams are trying to play and high lines and pressing and goalkeepers need to be higher off their lines. That is really important in my estimation of the methodology I have that, that we need for goalkeepers right now. Okay. So I think you said a few things that I, I love there about it's mostly emotional intelligence. And I think a lot of times it's difficult maybe to see that in video. And I know uh, for us, you know, we were, we're scouting different goalkeepers in college this, this year. And uh, sometimes you want to make that phone call and you want to ask, Hey, what, obviously we're seeing what we're seeing from the physical attributes and their ability to make big saves and cross take yeah. and all that. So those are the, the tangible things you can see, but also the intangibles as well, the emotional profile. So maybe what would be some of the questions that you or have you asked when scouting a goalkeeper to kind of have a better idea of their emotional intelligence and emotional profile? Yeah, I, th I think starting with the coaching staff is probably ideal because you get an idea then of, you know, look, you, you can see in, in game scenarios, sometimes you can see up one nil, down one nil, whatever it is, what the game's asking, how they're emotionally intelligent, how they talk to players. You can't see that on a video, but you obviously, if you're, you know, you, you can hear things when you're watching the games. But I think asking coaches how they are interacting with their teammates. Are they a leader? Are they just someone that kind of falls, you know, into the group and does what they're asked of? You know, what kind of information are they giving to their their teammates? Do they take moments of breaks in games, injuries, goal kicks, corner kicks, whatever it is, to wrap their arm around the center backs, right back, left back, whatever it looks like, the people that they're, they're closest to, to help them out a little bit. You know, I, I want to say they're intangibles, but for me, it's a tangible because they're things that are that you can touch, you can feel. You know, I think too, when you sit with the goalkeeper or you're on an interview with them or you're talking to them on the phone or whatever it is, the things that you're listening for is, you know, the ability to speak, the ability to express themselves quite comfortably, the ability to be comfortable when they're talking about certain aspects of their game. And you kind of get a, a good sense of it, whether they're, they're just trying to appease you or they're actually being honest about how they see themselves. And I think we've all been around long enough now that you can get a good sense of that. Um, you know, just their general demeanor of, you know, how they're speaking to you, how they're answering things. Are they coming back with you with good questions? Not just yes, 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 yes. And they never ask you, okay, so you know, when you guys build in a three, you know, are you looking to mm -hmm. 
tilt one way, does a right sided player get high? Does a left sided player come down? Do you build with two pivots? You know, what's the setup high? That to me, when they start asking those questions, there is a an intelligent amount of information that they are retaining from wherever they are that is going to build into their ability to lead, ability to to have personality on the field, to see things, to make decisions quickly, you know. And then obviously you're taking that information from the coach and the the player, what you're getting back from the interview, and then you're watching it live on the field. Now it is very hard to watch video and get a really good sense of a goalkeeper, in my opinion. People send you highlight videos and I always ask, I say, look, give me some of the goals that you can see. If we're scouting a, a, a goalkeeper for the first team, and here's a great example, I go to the goals conceded. I want to see where the goals have come from, how they're reacting to them, how their teammates are reacting to them, what is their reaction to their teammates. That's probably a place that I start before I go into breaking it down completely then because I think it gives you a lot of emotional evaluation. Just like when you see you, you're scouting a striker and the striker scores and he goes off to celebrate and his teammates go in the opposite direction. There's something there. Guy scores and everybody goes to him. He's got the buy-in of his teammates. Hmm. You know, so the, the, the little things that you're looking for, yes, they can be intangibles, but I think too, that's a feel for me. It's a touch. It's a tangible thing that you can grab hold of and you can actually find and dig right into that will help you in your scouting, will help the, the young kids in their development as well. Yeah, I'm curious about retention levels. And I think something that I've noticed being in this uh, LAFC environment for the past few years is the best players, they can acquire new information and the application is seamless or it's maybe one day, not even one training session, they're already applying the things. I think maybe retention for you, have you had any good examples of that or any goalkeepers or players that you've seen and you're just like, okay, this person's learning ability is just through the roof. I think our current 2006, Adam Boudry, who's in the national team for the 17s, his ability to comprehensively evaluate the information that he's been given and apply it immediately is is quite impressive. Very intelligent kid away from the football field. But some of the, like even the reports that, you know, when I was speaking to the head coach and the goalkeeping coach of the national teams for, for his age group, you know, every time, you know, sometimes I have different goalkeeper coaches in there, but the the, the constant report is that, Every goalkeeper coach is different. So they're, they're talking differently in their verbiage and their technical, you know, techniques and the tactical side of it. But they've always said that his ability to take on board what he's being asked of him and then put it immediately into practice has been impressive. Now, I think the learning curve for that would then be when he comes back to the Rapids and they have a style of play and US soccer, we're trying to build out from the back, whatever it looks like. The, let's just say, for example, they're building with a three and they want the center back to give the ball to the goalkeeper in, in the in the goal kick scenario. But we want the goalkeeper to give the ball to the right center back to look to, to go around them or through them or whatever it looks like. I think sometimes when they're away in lengthy camps and they come back, they can revert to, oh, I'm going to get the ball from the center back and go that direction where their style of play is to get it. Know from them to go to the next person to go to the next person, and and you can see that kind of that switch sometimes that becomes a little bit difficult for young players. But adds ability to, as that's not how we're going to do it, you know here. To revert back and forth between the national team that he's spending a lot of time with now and the Rapids group it is quite impressive, and I think it then goes to the coachability side of it is that if you're retaining that information, and you're comprehensively evaluating it, and then being able to put it into practice quickly really without too much overthinking. I think that's the biggest part of it too. So much information going in and they start to overthink it all and it becomes a bit of an issue. But I think his ability to flip flop back and forth between the two and evaluate the scenarios and put into practice what is best in the moments, I think has been quite impressive. And I think for a young man, it is a very valuable tool to have. Yeah, and it's uh, from intelligence, confidence, all the little attributes and characteristics that if you were to dream up the ideal goalkeeper, that is probably what you'd say. How would you maybe give any advice to, to young coaches or uh, coaches in the academy system? How do we try to instill a lot of those characteristics from a young age or maybe even create the week-to-week -week environments that instill that, but also have the, the players kind of explore that piece of their identity that has yet to form? Yep, I, I think, and it goes back to the, the old thing, it's trying to create game scenarios in training. And you can't do it all the time because goalkeeper training doesn't lend itself to that all the time. But trying to find the days, the moments within sessions in your session build where you can give them game realistic scenarios 
that are going to test the emotional ability, are going to test their resolve, are going to test their tempo control, ability to handle the situation with other players around them. You know, whether it's borrowing a couple of players from a team, strikers, some center backs, whatever it is, whether it's making your training group a little bit bigger. So maybe you usually train with four to six goalkeepers. Maybe you make it eight to 10 on that particular day and offer some game-like scenarios where you can use people goalkeepers as center backs you can use them as outside backs you can use them as sixes you can find moments where they have to control people around them they have the ability to control a tempo they have the ability to control themselves within a tempo and it's something i do a lot with the first team guys is you know we do a two or three ball combination drill and all three different balls but the non-ability to go from one ball to the next at a million miles an hour like you receive a ball i'm playing you as the six and you'll see a lot of kids they receive it they play you and they're already on to the next ball before you've actually received the ball. You know, so what happens in the six if the six loses the ball? I've got to honor that one first. I've got to find my position in that one first. Then I can make my way across to the next one. Um, I think they're teaching moments for me where we can evaluate emotional control. We can evaluate their emotional control in that moment is just to relax, make sure the six secures the ball or the wing back or the center back, whatever it is, and then move on to the next one. And then change my, my flow, my rhythm, my brain everything into that next pass or that next ball or that next shot or whatever it looks like, but creating those moments within our training sessions where we can test them a little bit. We can push their boundaries a little bit in, in, in that environment without being able to have a game like scenario, which we can't create all the time, like a, a real, real, real game like scenario. You can get to good moments in goalkeeper training that look just like they should in the game. Um, but I think as young goalkeepers, and young goalkeeper coaches, when we have the ability to maybe expand the group a little bit at times, yes, okay, we may take it. People may say, are you taking away from reps? Okay, I understand that. But you're also giving them valuable uh, time with other things that you can't particularly work on when you're working in groups of three or groups of four that look exactly like what you might replicate in a game. Okay, so the training environment, again, I was able to mic you up and I got to see how you communicated with every single goalkeeper. And I think the emotional side, obviously you were, uh, I was, I would rate you a 10 out of 10 on that. Cause I was definitely, I walked away with so many little notes, not just on the actual like technical corrections and all that, but actually how you handled each one of those guys. So I know it's not always ideal because you always have the number one and obviously you want to give them their run, but you have the two, three, maybe an Academy guy or a second team guy joining the group. So for you, Chris, in your experiences, how would somebody make it more difficult on you? to kind of have that final decision coming into the weekend to say, Hey, you know what, this guy's, I mean, it's undeniable at this point. Mm -hmm. Will's been a wonderful example of that this year. You know, we brought Marco in obviously a, a top highly routed young, touted young goalkeeper and Will's embraced the competition. Marco is now just I actually said to Marco before the game last night, he's actually now just hitting his stride. Like he had a, a bit of a break in that between the end of their season world cup and then coming into us with the visa stuff. But it's made it's made Will better. It's made Marco better. That competition has been made better. And a result, Abe has been playing out of his skin up until he got hurt. You know, uh, Adam's come in and done really well. So I think for those those guys who maybe aren't starting on the weekend, you know, and 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 our head coach Robin says it the best. You know, we evaluate every training session to see where you're at. Now, it may be a little bit different for field players than it is for goalkeepers because you need, in my opinion, you need to play games. You need to be in those environments where there is pressure moments where you are making decisions with people coming at you and in crowds and closing space or staying or whatever, whatever it looks like. But I think if you are, if you are training every day at the highest level um, as a young goalkeeper, you are, and this is, I'll get to this point in a minute because I think it's a big one. You are going off into your team environment then and instilling what you're learning from your goalkeeper coach into those team environments, whether it's 8v8, 6v6, 4v4s, building out from the back, crossing and finishing, whatever the team is working on that day, you know, collective possession to advance up the field, starting from the goal kick, whatever it looks like. If you are excelling in that and you are you are the number two and the number one is playing well, those are the moments where you can maybe go, oh, the, the coach may go, okay, well, Omar's trained really, really well this week. He's actually trained really well last week and he's trained really, really well the week before. Now you're starting to build yourself a, a case there of maybe why you should be playing. Then all of a sudden something happens, a suspension, an injury, you got back-to-back -back games, whatever it looks like. The goalkeeper has a, a couple of bad games back-to-back. -back. 
you're ready to rock and roll when you get in there. So many times I see I'm the number two, I'm the number three. I'm just going to go through the motions. All of a sudden, the, the, the knock on the door comes, you're playing and you haven't been training at your max potential. You haven't been pushing yourself every day. The goalkeeper coach hasn't been pushing you every day. It's hard if you haven't played for three, four, five, six weeks, two months, whatever it looks like as a number two. That has to be your edge every single day that if something does happen, the what if, I go in, I need to be ready to rock and roll. And that doesn't matter if you're the first-team goalkeeper or you're at U12, U13, U14 level for me. You, you have to find that. And the other part too is, guys, I think from for me, I was a number two all my life. And I'm speaking from experience. I push hard, the number one gets better. I push hard, the number three gets better. I push hard, I end up getting better because I've got to keep myself clear away from the number three. I'm trying to advance to be the number one. You just make everybody around you better. And, and I said this to you, Omar, two years ago. The best piece of advice I ever got was from Argentina's goalkeeper coach in 2015 when I went into to their camp for a week. And we were watching my video, my training video. And he goes to me, Chris, I love the sessions, but everything's geared towards you, number one. And I was like, yeah, well, he's got to, I've got to get him ready for the weekend. He went, yeah, I never forget, he went, gear everything towards your number two. Because your number two is the most important goalkeeper. Your number one will always be happy because he's always playing. But if the number two is not pushing the number one, the number one's not getting any better. If the number two is not pushing the number one, the number three's got nothing to catch. And the number two is naturally going to get better if you're gearing everything towards him. It was an unbelievable way of looking at it. And it changed my whole processes. Now, obviously, the number one needs things 100%. And every goalkeeper is different. They all need different things. But... If you are pushing the button with the two, the one is going to get pushed. And you'll, you'll find your time within the week to work on the processes with the one and the three and the four. But the two is going to pull the three. The two is going to push the one and the two is going to get better naturally in those environments. And then you've got to find games for them. You know, So to me, that was an amazing bit of information, something that I've really honed into my methodology at all levels because I think it's massively important. I think you made a really good point there. The story is amazing, but I think the one you said earlier was build a case. At every level and at every position you have, you need to build that case, not only for the ones that are looking at you and the eyes that are kind of making sure that uh, you're staying on task, but also for yourself to be like, you know what, I'm standing on a, a strong foundation because I know every single day I've showed up, clocked in, did what I needed to do, acted as a professional, walked up the field, nutrition, weights, everything, schooling, acted as a professional. And I feel like maybe that's now you kind of like, shook me a little bit to me like, damn, I, that's why I was always so nervous for my position because I never built my case strong enough to actually uh, solidify in my own head that I was the guy. Yep. I think too, mate, you know, and, and nowadays too, a, a young player, any position has one good session and they go in and go, why am I not playing? Well, hang on. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're trying to knock out a goalkeeper, a field player who's played 10 consecutive games for all intents and purposes. So they have 10 games of building their case. You haven't played yet. So your case is built nine to five, Monday through Friday. The time you show up, what you put in your body, your prehab, your rehab, your weight session, the work you do on the field and training. Then you do it Tuesday. Then you do it Wednesday. Then you do it Thursday. Then you do it Friday. Then you're asked to play in the Resi's game on Sunday. R2s, MLS is next, whatever it looks like. Bang, you go and do that. You do it well. You keep a clean sheet. There's, there's week one case done. Next week it comes again. We go the whole kit and caboodle again. Now you're building yourself a lovely foundation, not only for you when your, your number's called, but also to make the case the coaching staff to go, I'm ready to rock and roll, guys. You, you When you give me that chance, I'm going to walk for that door. You know, or in, in, the, in the professional environment, you're playing Saturday, Wednesday, Saturday. At what point does the, the head coach go, you know what, we'll give, we'll give Omar the game on Wednesday and you run with it. You know, and I've seen it so many times. I've seen it so many times. An injury happens or something goes goes awry to the number one and then the number two steps in and either absolutely demolishes it and the number two never get the number one never gets back in, or they get a run of four, five, six games. And because they weren't or didn't have the foundation across the first course of two, three, four months, it takes them six games to get going again. And by that time, they haven't built their case to stay in the, the goal at that point or on the field as a six or a center back or whatever it looks like. You know, and I think that's a, a massive case. And I think the schooling stuff is massive right now too. We have our, our young boys online school and I can see it, it affects them. When, when their grades drop, their football drops. When their grades are doing well, their football increases because they're not thinking about that internally whilst they're on the, on the training ground either. 
you know, so it is building a case. It is building a case over the course of time. It is making sure that you're training well and doing the right things, turning up on time, active in videos. If the coach is asking you to cut your own clips and send them to him, be the first one in there. You give good re revisions of yourself. If you're active in team meetings, like there's so much that goes into it. Yeah. It's almost like you can't, you can't really take a, a backseat. It'd be very intentional. You can't have any passiveness towards your own career. And yeah. I think um, I'm going to ask, I was going to ask you kind of for a, one last piece of advice before we sh uh, switch up to more of, uh, you know, advice to coaches and your experiences, mm -hmm. but it seems like you kind of already all packed that in there uh, for me, but if you want to summarize or even be add on to that one final piece of advice that young players maybe are missing nowadays, and you've kind of maybe just thought about it recently and said, Oh my God, this is what's missing for the, the next generation. I think for me, it's the, I just mentioned it. It's the ability to be resilient when you're not playing. And by that, I mean, you're not always going to get it the way you want it to be, you know? And I think, you know, nowadays we've got a lot of social media. There's a lot of things that are out there, you know, a, a lot of different athletes, a lot of different sports, but I think you're not always going to get given your opportunity straight away. You're not always going to get given your opportunity after one good training session. You're not always going to get the second opportunity after one decent game. You have to continually perform every single day. You have to turn up at 8 a.m. or whatever it is, but the, the call time, you know, if it's four o'clock for the, for the young academy guys, you have to turn up ready to roll every day yes people are going to have off days i get that, that and that is not an issue you're going to have family things and you're going to have you know school things and you're going to have things that just aren't right on certain days which is no problem at all but if you're there on time with your head down ready to work doing the right things doing the right things away from training like you, we can even see too you know for guys that have been in the game long enough you can see when you're doing the right things away from the football field sleeping well eating well it, it all adds up but I think to answer your question, if the young boys and girls right now could be a little bit more resilient in their hastiness to need to play, if they're not playing right away, have a look at the person who's in their position. Why are they starting over me? What do they have that I don't? What do I need to work on that they don't have? I think for me, you then go back to my use of a term before, you build yourself a bigger and better case to why you should be playing. And it doesn't matter if it's an academy level or a first team level. We see it, you know, every day at all levels, you know, that the young kids get very antsy very quickly if their number's not called or they feel like they're going to miss out in the game on the weekend. Or it doesn't mean you're forgotten about. It just means maybe the coach has a different game plan for this weekend and didn't see you fitting into the plan. Maybe that the lad in front of you or the girl in front of you had a really good training week and they just felt they just tipped you on the scales for the weekend. Maybe they feel the left back of the opposition is not a quick player and there's one person that's got a bit of speed that can play on the right hand side there's so many different things that goes into it just that you're not good enough is not not the answer it's just that there is obviously the coach is going through a lot of different things and how they want to set up for the weekend but rest assured that you're going to be fully thought of when the subs are being made you look down the sideline and go okay young omar go and get him okay you've got 22 minutes i'm going to make a difference go on there and make a difference for 22 minutes then you can build yourself more of a case you know, and I think that's what I would love to see more of in the young generation right now is just that absolute resiliency that when you're the disappointment in not being selected or the disappointment in being subbed out or whatever it looks like, that there is a reason why. And, you know, A, don't be afraid to go on and knock on the boss's door and say, hey, look, coach, what do I need to do to start? What Where, where do you see me? What, what are the thoughts for me? How did I think I performed this week? And if you're giving everything you can, you have yourself a case to go in there and ask that question. If you know in here that I wasn't on time, I didn't give myself a great chance yesterday, that I wasn't great at training today, it starts with, with, with I. What can I do differently? And that's what I hope the young generation can kind of start to embrace and take hold of. Well, well said. That was, I love that. I think that's the, uh, you can always put a positive spin if you almost turn everything internal versus blending other people. And that positive self-awareness and kind of reassurance because you are being proactive and stepping in the right direction um, can really give you that resiliency in those gray gray areas and those moments that uh, the clouds kind of following you around for a little bit um, but I want to turn the page now and kind of shift to more advice for coaches and I feel whenever I've spoken to you and I've spoken to other top coaches your journey has been anything but easy anything but seamless failure is so important for all of us so for you, failures throughout your career, are there any that you've kind of pinpointed and saying like, one, I hated it in the moment, but I'm so happy this happened to me and I really cherish it. 
my my biggest drive for myself is my fear of failure and, and it's not a it's not a it's not you know, i say you fear it's not a fear it's just i don't want to fail a myself but probably more importantly my goalkeepers in the moment i want to make sure that they're getting every moment is precious on the football field I think one of the, maybe a, a position I'm in that's a little bit lucky. I think one of the biggest things that I have taken away from the last, what am I in my 13th year, is that I have the ability now and have for some time to run a potential session with the academy goalkeepers prior to running it with the first team guys. And I think there's two, it's twofold for me. I, I was afraid early in my early times of, coaching i was afraid to try things in the training session because i didn't want them to fail and i didn't want it to look like you know uh, as we all talk about the session planning and, and the putting it together we've all had coaches where you feel like they just put something together and it's you know it has it has worked or it hasn't um but be precise and be direct in your ability to put the session together to achieve what you want to achieve but then if something's not working, if the goalkeeper's constantly getting beaten, maybe you're too close, maybe the angle's wrong, maybe they're, they're, you haven't got enough time to get there, whatever it looks like. I was always afraid to add those into my sessions because I didn't want the goalkeeper coming out of the, the, the Tuesday session going, wow, I, I faced X amount of shots today and I got beaten 37 times. You've just And you've just sucked the life out of them. The fine balance between them achieving success and then them not quite getting there and how do I push that limit so that moment becomes a reality for them where they can get there quite comfortably. And I think that was my early struggle with, with the coaching piece of it was making it maybe a little bit too, I don't want to use the word easy, but a little bit too structured in my session planning back in 2013 and 2014 where it wasn't challenging them enough. And I was afraid to really get after them because what if it, the, the, the session went sideways and it was constant goal, goal, goal. And I didn't have the experience that that may be moment to change the, the session within the run of it. I think those early days really helped me massive amounts because then what I started to do is, okay, great. So what I want, I want to achieve this tomorrow. We're playing LAFC this weekend. We've got a Wednesday session. I need to achieve what I'm going to see from Vela, from Boanga, from you know the, the, the guys up front in those moments and, and I want to push the boundaries here. I really want them to struggle. I want them to find success in the struggle to get to the position they need to get to. So I would go and test it the night before with the academy kids. And I would look at, and look, you're, you're training, you know, good young goalkeepers. So it was good. It was a good environment to be in. Um, and maybe I had more kids in the session that I was going to have three or four goalkeepers in the session the next morning. But I think those failures early doors, and they weren't always outwardly seen because they some of the guys did i don't know any different but you intrinsically do but then my ability to change my mindset and go you know what push the boundaries push it put yourself in a position me in a position that i'm uncomfortable knowing that they're going to be uncomfortable knowing that if they do succeed in this session i've just made them that much better in the course of the last 45 minutes and i think when i when i changed that thought process i felt the sessions went to another level and then I was able to kind of build from that. And then again, you go back to what you said before. Every goalkeeper is different. Everyone needs different things. Every goalkeeper needs different, has different strengths and weaknesses. You're trying to change. Obviously, every club's got a profile. They're looking for the goalkeeper. But the profile of the goalkeeper, everyone's slightly different in their starting positions, their ending positions, you know, whatever it looks like, their movement to get someplace. But once I felt that I was failing myself and maybe my goalkeepers a little bit in my session development, early on in my career and I got over that hurdle of being a bit more vulnerable and making the goalkeepers want to push the limits a little bit, whether it's physical in a physical session, whether it's, you know, in, in a, in a session, like I said, a, a, a planning for the opposition on the weekend, whether it was in a preseason where you're trying to achieve certain things that really turned the corner for me. And I think my session planning was able to take it up another notch. And obviously from there, you know, next year, the next year, next year, you just evolve from that. And obviously you get to know your goalkeepers and where you can really push their buttons too. That was probably the biggest one for me, mate, that it kind of sits with me you now when I look back at it now, because then it resonated through the academy. It resonated through the first team. It resonated through my individual ability to push the individual um, mm -hmm. and get out of it on a daily basis of what they really needed. Exactly what you're saying, the fear of failure, because you almost want to, 
put on, not even a front, like you want to make sure the exterior is being perceived in a way that everything that you're presenting to these goalkeepers, everything you're presenting to everybody is so buttoned up and so tight. So, I mean, that's why for me, sometimes I was always so safe with my sessions, just like maybe yeah. you were too. It's like, you don't want any little bit of doubt to seep in. Like you're saying is that when you kind of like relieve yourself of that fear, you have, like you're saying more vulnerability and it pushes the envelope even further because everybody feels a little stretched, but you're doing it in a cohesive way. Yeah. And I think too, like you get a feel in the session as well. Where like maybe something's not quite, the angle's not quite right. The distance they're traveling is not quite right. The distance of the cutbacks a little bit too far. Whatever it is, whatever the, yeah. the, 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 the thing is. But then, once you once you know you've got the boys, you can go. You know what? I'm going to move this mannequin three yards left. I'm going to move the starting spot a yard and a half to the right. Whatever it looks like, it becomes more game realistic. But you can make that tweak on the spot, and the boys are going, okay, fantastic. Mm -hmm. I understand that. Or and this is probably the, the back part of your, your thing. And, and Will says it to me all the time. And Tim, and this is probably the first time I heard it, probably about a year into to, to working with Tim. 2017, after he came back from his groin injury. And, you know, I'm, you know how I am with the session planning. I'm, I'm obsessive with it. I love it. <laughs> yeah. um, reps and everything and, and where the positions and the angles and what we're getting to and how much it is on the, on the loading and so on and so forth. But T would come into me and, and after, like two days after a game, and, and I'd go, how are you feeling today, bud? I've got this in mind. I want to go over it with you before we do it. And he goes, I trust you. Whatever you think I need today. And then I started to go, all right. He knows I know what I'm doing to some extent. So yeah. I've got to trust myself now that I've got this. I'm nailing this on every single day. And and, and then like the Willie goes, Willie, this is the plan for the day is what we're going to do. X, Y, Z, Marco, trust you, Chris you do what you think is going to get me the best in the best spot for the weekend. I want to tap into that real quick, Chris, about Tim. And I know I just want to just, if I was a fly on the wall, when you got the information that Tim was going to be coming, were you nervous, excited? Were you being put to the test? Maybe your anxiety started to creep in kind of like take me through the early days. And then also to kind of how you were able to build that relationship with Tim. Uh, nervous. Yes. <laughs> uh yes that is probably the first thing that come I, I, nervous and anxious i think was it was the it was probably one of the longest six months i've had because we knew we were getting him in like january and he didn't arrive until the back end of june i don't ever forget the first phone call i had with him you know he was he was lovely he said look uh, i've heard wonderful things about you i don't know you but i would love to sit down with you when we meet and kind of go through your methodologies see where you see me, see what you think of myself. I would like to tell you how I like to do things. And that was brilliant. But he said to me from the very, very start, if you can show me why you're doing something and how it's going to make me better, I'm 100% all for it. And when he said that to me, I was like, fantastic, because I know that's one of my strengths. So I've spent three months looking at everything, national team, Everton clips, back to Man United stuff when he was a little bit younger. And pulling things out that I could start to see that I thought, you know what, I can help him here. I can make him better in this moment. I can change this a little bit. We, yeah, because he was so wanting to still learn, which was the best thing about T. Even at, when I, what I got him at 35, 36, he still wanted to learn. He still wanted more. He still craved the national team environment. There was so much that we 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 had to achieve still. So that that first six months was was anxiously nervous because I was getting arguably the biggest player this country's ever produced. We were bringing him for a, a big reason. And I still felt he had the ability to be the number one for the national team, which obviously was undoubted at the time. So I think the conversations we had in the ensuing months to, to get there. And then when we sat down in my office for the first time, actually we sat in DC for, for about half an hour when we met. Um, but then we sat in my office the first time and I had to put together a presentation of certain moments of certain things of, of the way I see it, the, the little bits and pieces in here. And he went, let's go. I think at that moment he felt like I 100% cared about him. And as he used, he said, still said to me now, there were moments where I felt you cared more about me than I cared about me, you know? And that, I think that was the beginning of the building of the relationship, you know? And I think that when T got injured at the back end of 16, and, and the other part too, is Zach was playing out of his mind for the first half of 2016. I mean, you know, we were top of the table. Zach was arguably the best goalkeeper in MLS in 2016. Um, Tim and Zach won Colorado Rapids player of the year for, for the first half of the season for Zach and the second half of the season for Tim. 
Um, so I, I think there was so much good going on at the club at the time with the goalkeepers. And Z was playing out of his mind. He was putting his case forward. I was able to give all my time to Z at that moment. But I think that when T did his groin against Mexico in November of 2016 and then wanted to be back by March for the qualify, World Cup qualifiers against Panama, and it was like the 28th of March, and there was a game against Red Bulls the week before, and that was kind of going to be his tipping point. But it was going to be like a month early than what he should have been back. And we went through the whole off-season to kind of put everything together for him to make it smack bang right. I went out to his place. We stayed there. We went and trained. I think at that moment, he kind of went, wow, this this guy really, really does care about me and my career. And I'm going to put all my trust into him because he's giving me everything he's got right now. That was kind of, the first six months was brilliant. But at that point, that back in 2016, it was kind of like, that's when we, it kind of became a, a bond, a partnership, and obviously where we are today. But yeah, mate, it was it was a, it was a, an anxiously nerve wracking first few months just because I wanted to get it right because I knew if I nailed it, then then I would have him on my side from day one. And fortunately, that that's how it turned out to be. So it seems. I mean, I think the team, mate, that was so comfortable in learning, so comfortable in wanting more, so comfortable in asking questions and saying to you, hey. Show me why this is going to make me better, and I'm all for it. It seems like you have so many good habits. I think a fear of failure obviously drives a lot of the decisions that you make. Obviously, you talked about your dad and him kind of keeping the standard as high as he did. And then now, whether it's uh, Zach, whether it's Tim, whether it's Willie, like you're always, always, I don't know, just the comfort of knowing that you've taken every precaution necessary, every little detail into account to make sure that they're ready to go. Um, so I think those are the good habits, but. I think for us coaches, mm -hmm. having that self-realization, maybe looking inward sometimes, we know that there are certain bad habits that we can't bring with us as we transition maybe into the professional world. So were there any at the beginning of your coaching career that maybe now you look back on and say, thank God I got rid of that bad habit? I, I think it was the overthinking, mate. I'll be honest with you. It was the overthinking. Like I, I was, I still am such a perfectionist, but I was, to the other end of it where it would keep me up at night that I wanted to make sure I got it right. And in the not trusting in, you know what, you're, pre you're prepared. You're not not prepared for this, you know, and maybe not having thought the session through to what happens if this doesn't work, what is my plan B? What am I going to with this? What are my twigs gonna be within this session? Early doors where, okay, here's my session plan. We're going to run with this. We're going to stick with this. If it works, great. If it doesn't, okay. And then I think this comes with time and experience too, but you have a little bit of a plan B and a plan C just in case the distances are slightly off. Maybe the servers on the day can't hit the backside of a barn door. Like there, there's so many, you know, it's you get out there on a crossing session and it's blowing 35 mile an hour. What, what's my, how am I going to change this? Mm. You know, you get, you walk in the morning and, the two boys say, you know what, I'm pretty sore from the leg day yesterday in the gym. You know, I, I, great. What, how can I pull the reps down? How can I shorten the distances? How can I uh, make the loading not as big? You know what I'm saying? Oh, I had a tough yeah. night last night. My kid was up sick all night. I, I never accounted for that. Those things, we're doing this, Omar. This is how it's going to be. This is what we're doing today. And that was early in my infancy as a coach. I look back at that and I think such a great teaching tool now. And I look at the young coaches I have under me is where do you make your tweaks within a session when it's not quite working, when there's not quite enough success where, you know, young Omar and old Omar have had a, a night with no sleep because their kids have been up all night or you've been on the phone to Australia for half the night because your mum's not well or whatever it's been where you have to be able to emotionally adjust for the players and still trying to continually, like I said earlier, there's no time to waste. So how do I not waste their time and build a little bit on the weekly environment? That was something that, I think early doors, and again, I think it comes with experience, but just those learning moments were massive for me. Did you feel like you had to, because I think a lot of times when we, you know, sometimes during COVID as well, when we're on the Zoom calls and stuff, there's a lot of people who on paper, they can tell you, this is how you should handle a situation. And I think the emotions and maybe even when you drop your sessions, you say, this is how it's going to go. But once you actually right. experience those things, it's a completely different set of emotions, of reactions. You get to learn a lot about yourself. So would you say to all the young coaches, just like employers too, maybe, experience that failure 
and just as it's happening, kind of be present in the moment? Is that kind of how you took care of everything? Yeah, I think it's just getting over the fear of not embracing it. Like it, it, there comes a point where you've got to go, okay, I, I need to alter something here to make myself better, me as the coach. But if you keep going, nah, it was good. Nah, it was good. Nah, the session was good. And you kind of know that mm, I could have made a little adjustments in there. When you embrace that, and, and it wasn't until like the back end of 2014, if I'm being honest with you, like the end of my second year in the professional coaching environment, that I kind of went, you know what? The self-reflection piece of this, I've got to alter some things in the way I see and think about it just to make the week become more effective for the game day on the weekend. The week become more effective for the, the goalkeeper's ability to progress so they they weren't just plateauing, they were on that upward trajectory. You know, and then obviously things come with data and you can use that now and there's so many more things they could than 12, 13 years ago. But I think that when you embrace those moments where you feel like trust your gut a little bit is probably what I'm saying. You feel like you can manipulate the session. You feel like you can manipulate the the outcomes a little bit for success or for failure, whatever it looks like and whatever you're trying to achieve. And then I think the other part of this too that I haven't really mentioned it is get around your goalkeepers. Get around them. Like go in and see them at breakfast. Go in and talk to them if, if the academy kids um, before their sessions. If they're going on online school and they've got a video session, go in and, and, and stick your arm around them and see how they're feeling and, you know, have they had a hard day at school? Did they have two tests? Have they not eaten since 12 o'clock? You know, uh, are they empty, are they on an empty stomach? Do they, are they dehydrated? You know, has their sister been sick all night? There's so many tangibles in that that will help you. But once I realized that, you know, I've only got, I only had three or four goalkeepers in the morning to take care of where obviously the, the field players are 27, 30, 31, whatever it is. Same in the afternoon. You've only got six, seven, eight, nine, ten goalkeepers to take care of. Get to know them. Know them personally. Everyone's different. It'll allow your sessions to go to another level because you have a, a feel, a tangible feel for each individual. I love that. Okay, Chris, I know you got to run, so I, I don't want to keep you here for too much longer, but I'm going to ask you one more question. What do you think is is the meaning of all this, of everything that we're experiencing uh, of life? And for you, I'm sure you I said overthinking, but hopefully now for good. What do you think is is the meaning for, for everything that we do? I'm a big believer, mate, that everyone's here for a reason. Everyone's got a purpose. Everyone's, whether it's to be a dad, to be a mom, to be a police officer, to be a fireman, to be a, a goalkeeper coach. I believe everyone's here for a reason because it's what makes the world go around. Everyone's so very different. You know, and I, I think for me, looking at it now, I had an interesting 13-year playing career. Many different countries, was never really nailed on as a number one, got frustrated at, it at times, got a couple of okay moves as a number two, but wondered why no one ever saw me as a starter. Like, why Why was I not Was I not big enough? Was I not tall enough? Was was I, I thought I was pretty technically clean. I had good feet. Was I not a good enough leader? I knew I was pretty decent in the dressing room as a teammate. But now I look at it, my purpose as a number two was to understand how when I'm sitting on this side of the desk and coaching these guys, how it felt to not be the starter. And for me, started, starting players, goalkeepers, are always going to be happy because they're playing. That's, that's the bottom line. They're going to want to work on things. They're going to want to get better at things 100%. But the boys and girls that aren't playing are the ones that we need to have a, a feel for, an understanding for, how do I connect with them emotionally, maybe spiritually to help them on their journeys going forward when the kids aren't playing, when the first team players aren't playing? Now I look back at it, I understand that, that was my purpose for 13 years of my professional career was to sit here and be able to be the best goalkeeper coach I can be. But all my time as a player and not starting was to help me understand what they're feeling in this moment right now. And I think it would have been very different if I had a 13-year unbelievably successful career as a player and sitting here going, why are you knocking on my door as a number two? I know how you felt. I know why. I think that's made me, honestly, a better coach. It's made me a better understander of how human emotion works. So to answer your question, I think my 13-year career of playing wasn't decorated by any stretch of imagination. In fact, I've probably played more reserve team games than anybody else sitting in, in, in this chair right now. But it gave me the understanding of how I can help those players and push my number ones to be better and number twos to be better and 
the threes to be better and emotionally understand where they're feeling and where they're coming from in the moments of hardship when they feel like they should be playing. That is my purpose of me playing and then where I sit right now. That's how I feel about it. That is a the hell of a realization. I could tell. I could tell. I feel like that's the the sense that I got the first time we met and and I mic'd you up at the beginning and you were asking the guys, hey, what'd you do in your day off? Oh, you went here, you went there. And it was just like a nice subtle conversation with each person. And it's so funny because you can be on the outside looking in and say, oh, it's just a small conversation. Mm -hmm. But I feel like now that I've gotten into the coaching side of things, there are days too where you feel really low. There are days where you have no energy, but it just mm -hmm. it, that you understand when you start stacking things up over time, those small conversations really start to give you an idea how much you're committed, what this player is, where their mindset is every morning. Like you said, do they have a kid at home who's crying all night and now you kind of have an idea of putting up, you know, put their arm around them. And I mm -hmm. feel like it's just that little bit of effort goes such a long way. And when you, when you read that statement versus actually putting it into action, it's so much more daunting to just do those little small conversations every single day versus yeah. you read it and you're like, come on, easy five, one or two questions a day. It's not a big deal. Come on. But when you actually have to do it, you're like, oh crap, this is a lot more than I expected. I mean, I, I'm sure I bug my guys. I must ask them half a dozen times in a session. How they feel? How are you feeling? How the legs? How are you feeling? I'm looking for different answers every time. I'm not looking. Yeah, I'm good. Yep. Good. Yep. Chris, I'm good. Sharpie, I'm good. I can see it. Uh, I have eyes. I, I know how you feel. Your your persona is giving me all I can see. But that little connection, like I worked Willie really last night before the game, hard. How you feel? Yeah, heavy, heavy. Legs are heavy, but good. Lungs are heavy, but good blow. Honest answers. You know, and that, okay, he's a little bit heavy. I know it's coming next. Maybe I tweak it. It, it, it's, you know, Marco, yep, feel great today. No, you know what, Coach, I had a heavy lift yesterday. My legs are a bit heavy. Brilliant. Okay, this is where we're going to be at today. It, you have to have that. I think that's massively important. I think it helps you connect with the guys, girls, understand them, see where they're at in their current situation because you have to have them, you have to coach them in that moment. You, you, you can't coach them four o'clock tomorrow, today. You have to coach them at four o'clock today and they might have had a terrible day today or they might have had an unbelievably good day. So, you know, you might have had an easy day planned. They come in and say, you know what, Omar, I'm ready to rock and roll today. Can we get after it? Great, let's go. Because you might not get that tomorrow from them. They might be feeling like, you know, uh, had a bad day and, and they might not feel great. So, and the same goes I love that. I love that. You're saying you're coaching them in in that moment. You're not coaching them. You're not preparing for their emotions tomorrow. You're coaching them. That's. I'm going to take that with me. That's huge. I love that. Yeah. Okay. Chris, I appreciate your time. I know you got to, we both got to run, but uh, hopefully, hopefully soon. I know we're going to Colorado, I don't know, a few weeks to, to play against uh, R2. And hopefully that uh, that result goes our way. We'll see how it goes. But <laughs> continue your guys' nine game unbeaten run. Continue, again, spreading your knowledge. And, and like you're saying, make everybody feel worthy, even if they are the second choice or whatever the situation is. Continue to kind of put your best foot forward and have those small conversations and build those relationships. And, uh, Hopefully, again, that vulnerability allows you guys to become closer. And I don't know, the coaching and, and the, the, the playing style can go even further. So thank you. Absolutely. I appreciate it. And uh, we'll see you soon. Okay, take care. Thank you, buddy. Appreciate it. See you soon. Of course. Bye-bye. So